Kane Brown. My name is Kelly Skelton. Ileana Mackey. Maya Pearl Crawford. And Evan Katra. And our presentation is titled Community Capability. We're representing the University of Massachusetts Lowell. We will be playing the part of consultants to Market Basket, whereas you are Market Basket. Um, we decided to do this because Lowell is our home currently, and Market Basket is a very near and dear place in our hearts. Um, it's very important to the community, so we decided to do a bit of analysis upon it. It's past, it's present, and it's future based on ethics. Great, that's one. Next slide, please. I'd like to open with this quote. We are the business, we are the ones who decide, and we are the ones who will only shop at Market Basket when RET is the owner. That's it. This is a quote stated from a protester in the Market Basket film known as We as the People, made in 2014. We chose this quote because it has a really good um, implementation on ethics on the community. And this woman who said this really conveyed emotion showing that Market Basket's care of the community is really what affects everyone and allow people to swell up in rebellion when their humanity was threatened. Uh, so Market Basket began as Demoulas, and Demoulas began as a butcher shop in Old Massachusetts founded by Athanasios Demoulas and his wife in 1916. Uh, he was a Greek immigrant and his values that he developed through his life in the acre of Lowell um, involved loyalty, togetherness, and strong family ties. And these were a lot of what was implemented into Market Basket at its foundation. Um, it was put into Demoulas initially when it was a Market Basket, and in 1938, he nearly lost his business to the $100 he had indebted to the bank. This $100 was accrued because he would give people free bread and ham within the community during the Great Depression because he believed in that type of family ties and that we were all in this together. And entering the second generation of your business, his sons Mike and George bought the business from him. Uh, they then experienced uh, a wave of expen exponential growth, um, both in sales and in terms of locations, opening up 15 locations in 15 years. And in the first two years of their business reign, uh, from $2,000 in revenue to $900,000 in revenue. Um, shortly after that, tragedy, lawsuits, and feud uh, took over and it created a uh, interesting, to say the least, uh, two-tier complex between the different managers. Now in terms of the management styles, um, what we've analyzed is that more of the corporate side came from the Ar Arthur S. family, um, and the Arthur T. family came from uh, more of the community-oriented slide. So Arthur S. wanted to support a compensation plan um, in, in which the committee um, of managers would be able to dictate all the compensation rather than taking that away from the current president, RDT. Um, in terms of prices, they were essentially completely polar. Um, Arthur S. wanted to support higher prices, whereas RDT wanted to support lower prices for the community. And the profit sharing plan was essentially the last straw in which Arthur S. wanted to eliminate it. Um, this was basically rewarding truck drivers and distribution um, warehouse workers that would serve for 20, 30 years in the company and would re return uh, into retirement with, two, uh, with $700 to $800,000 in retirement funds. He wanted to eliminate that completely. Um, in looking at your current president, um, RDT, this quote is incredibly important because it's simple and both powerful. Running a business and treating people in the way that they should be treated and running the business the way that it should be run. And that's how he saw his role in the company. So more on Arthur Telemachus Demoulas, also known as RDT. He was the son of Mike Demoulas, and he invested 40 years within Market Basket up to the point of his hire in 2008. Um, when he was raised under Mike, he knew he wanted to be in the family business, and he attributed a lot of his values to what the family did. He knew that Market Basket was a corporation that was making money, but he wasn't in it for the money. He wanted to continue his family's legacy. Um, his cousin Arthur S. and his side of the family did not see Market Basket that way. They wanted to live and they wanted to indulge in their own lives, and they only decided to step foot into Market Basket when they realized they could also profit from it. Under Arthur's, uh, Arthur T.'s control, the profits for the company grew um, from, actually the revenue grew from $3 billion to $4 billion, which is substantial, and employment grew from 14000 to 25000 
the hiring of employees was in no way a risk of profit for Market Basket. It actually helped them out because they would have more um, they would have more employees communicating the community aspect of Market Basket to its customers and making them feel welcome and a part of the family. Um, Arthur T is coined with saying, my management style is to do what's in the best interest of Damula supermarkets on any topic that I believe we're doing the best interest of Damula supermarkets. His entire plan was doing things in the benefit of the company. He would do things that would seem crazy um, and they would just be complete anarchy to Arthur S to the point where him trying to give back unheard of amounts of money to employees just seemed like just a mutiny, and they didn't want to have this at all. This led to the point of his termination on June 21st, and on June 24th, there began a slew of protesting over his termination. No one was happy that their humanity was being stripped by them, that was endowed by Arthur T. So, of course, the employees, the suppliers, um, even customers were going to take up arms, and Market Basket lost a reported $3 million a day. The protests subsided on August 27th, however, due to Arthur T finally deciding to buy the company back from Arthur S in order to gain full control and give people what they deserve. Now, many of your customers were thrilled initially hearing that RDT bought back the company. Uh, they thought that everything was all set. Uh, obviously, you took on a tremendous amount of debt when it was purchased back. You took in over a billion dollars. Um, and buying, buying that company back really set you back. And people were very, um, scrutinizing of whether you would be able to pay that money back. Now I know that you've had three record-breaking years in a row, um, cracking the five billion dollar mark each of those three years, um, but the industry in itself is changing rapidly. Um, in empires and in terms of automation, so in terms of empires, um, I'm sure that you're well aware that Kroger and Target are in talks of merging. Um, and other groceries are being bought up by major retailers offering kind of a one-stop-all shop. Um, automation is increasing tremendously. Um, Self-checkout stations are in just about every grocery store other than yours of yours. Um, online ordering and then now online delivering is also taking off. Um, but culture is on the decrease because when you, when you eliminate the people and the brand, it's really just the prices that you're enticing people with, and your company has tremendous branding with ethics. In terms of your key competitors now, it's no longer Stop and Shop and Shops and whatnot. It's Walmart and Amazon. These are huge conglomerates that are able to invest significant money into groceries. Um, however, they come with tremendous uh, ethical disputes. Um, in the Harvard Business Journal, Walmart was scrutinized for low employee wages. They would essentially pay the lowest employee wage that they could to still maintain their staff. Um, and in terms of eliminating small businesses, they would not only, when they go into a smaller town, eliminate all the small businesses because they were so much, they could compete on price and they were a one-stop shop. Um, they also, when they weren't successful, would then go out of business, leaving essentially a deserted small community. Amazon, on the other hand, purchased Whole Foods, um, essentially eliminating one of its competitors and opening up distribution and buying a brand um, that's very successful. They slashed the prices um, and they eliminated that competitor and essentially on day one were an effective uh, grocer. They also launched Amazon Go, which in terms of automation is a cashierless store, um, which completely lacks culture and there's one manager at a time in there. So, however, with all of these threat and all these all these threats to uh, Market Basket, there is a solution. Um, automation may be taking over, but that's not necessarily the way that Market Basket has to go. Their community element is very strong, and embossing on that should really help them in the long run. So one of the things that we propose is improving company culture, and this can be done in a few ways. Um, High-ranking employees should really exercise RDT's practices. He was the type of person who would come into a store and under Market Basket, he would know employees' names, he would know the names of their relatives. Um, in the Market Basket documentary, there's a store of him visiting one of his cancer-stricken employers, I mean employees, and he would go to the hospital and he would talk to him and his family and you don't see that type of race, that type of extent coming from someone who's a CEO. And I'm not asking that all managers do that, but it would be good for them to show interest in those below them. 
Uh, it would be very helpful for managers to also have forward-looking conversations to discuss performance goals and development and build these personal connections with their employees in order to discuss their future and how they should be in the company and whether they want to be in the company will really help these employees become uh, more together with Market Basket. And they won't necessarily just think of Market Basket as another job, but maybe as a gateway to future possibility. Customer care is another thing that we decided to look at. Um, fair pricing is already in play at Market Basket. You can see a lot of products that are well below market value, and it's fantastic because it allows people in neighborhoods where it might be difficult to get food, it allows them to get a good deal and buy quality, healthy foods at a decent price. Um, market Basket has been known to slash prices even like well below that because products are going bad, and because they're going to expire soon, they want to get them out the door as quickly as possible. And we would suggest that Market Basket take those products that are close to expiration and bring them to a food pantry because this food is just going to go to waste otherwise if customers don't buy it. And they'll be helping the local community. It is a very ethical solution to a very real and very constant problem. Um, sponsoring events is something that would also be very helpful. Um, if they could go into the communities and actually pay for things like fairs or uh, some type of community education where everyone gets together to learn something about a current problem of the community, something that may be ravaging the community, it would really bring the community together. They could realize Market Basket's value, something that stores like Walmart, Target, Kroger, and Walmart just are not doing at all. Now, so in review, uh, 2014 was a breakthrough in terms of your company. Um, in the communities, it was known for its ethical standing. However, this was brought on a global level. Uh, in terms of using ethics as your competitive advantage now, uh, I prepared a little statement, just a short reading. Uh, in daily life, especially in the grocery industry, it becomes increasingly important to reinforce your company beliefs and values and maintain your company culture. That is the end of our presentation. Are there any questions? Um, so what is, if you would, just summarize, what is, what is the ethical dilemma uh, that, is, that we're confronted with or, or clearly what is the issue in the ethical context that we're all right, so the ethical dilemma for Market Basket initially was Arthur S. and his demand that Market Basket be run more like a corporation and not like a decent business that invests in its employees. While this isn't necessarily a crime, he was deciding to slash benefits for employees that were already established and lower their pay and eliminate low pricing. Things that people would come to Market Basket for, he wanted to completely abolish. As Market Basket moves more towards the future and um, Arthur S. is completely eliminated from that, um, Market Basket is trying to safeguard against the unethical practices of Walmart and of Amazon of treating its employees poorly when a future might look bright in technology. Um, they have not currently done anything that would affect the employees in this regard, but when that looks like a promising future because people who are profiting rapidly, like Amazon, are doing it, this would be an effective safeguard to prevent any um, negativity going forward. And to expand on that a little, I know you, none of you may be from this area, but Market Basket is primarily based in Lowell and in New England. Um, they've had a history of offering significantly higher wages, wages than minimum wage and offering things like compensation, like bonuses based on how long you're employed. So a 10-year employee may get a larger bonus than someone that just started. So they implement things like that, and that was all being under, under threat with the old CEO. What's our net profit? What, how much money are we making on $5 billion? Currently, I cannot answer that as I look into it. I paid attention, or I should say we paid attention mainly to the revenue. Market Basket is profiting. They haven't been in the red for a very long time. In fact, the strike was the only time in the current, I think maybe the last 20 years that they've ever drawn negatives, and that was only for a short amount of time, two months. We're aware, obviously, that your company reports its revenue, but because you are a private company, we were, it was very difficult to obtain actual net profit.
what is what is the the, the legal structure of, of really what's going on? So, and I mean, I understand there's an ownership piece to legal elements in terms of belonging to belong, it was run by one owner, but really in the context of, of the issue here, what are the legal elements and the legal considerations? Are you talking about the legal ramifications of uh, using technology and substitution of normal employees? Uh, that, that, that could be, I'm asking you, what, what are the, the legal considerations in the context of the case? In the context of the case? Well, if we were deciding to go back to um, Arthur S., the legal ramifications there mainly came under ownership because uh, in the family, Mike, he decided, um, Mike was one of the previous owners and his decision was to do something with finances behind the family's back and the family basically decided that what he was doing was completely incorrect. So they decided to say he's messing with our money. We want to get involved in Market Basket to learn why he's messing with our money. It never got founded that he was doing anything sinister with it. And this prompted Arthur S. to want to take interest in the corporation. And when he wanted to take interest in the corporation, he wanted to do a lot of very shady things in order to gain more profit of it when Market Basket was already performing well. Arthur T. wanted to step in and not allow him to do these things that were seemingly criminal, not in the legal sense, but more in the humane sense of stripping people of their benefits and things that they deserved and things that were previously established in order to get more money when he was already one of the top 20 richest people in Boston. It was things that didn't make much sense and were done purely for personal gain. Nothing he did was inherently illegal, but what he did was morally incorrect and ethically incorrect. I think that with ethics, there's, there's the assumption that finance and uh, jurisdiction is tied into that. Um, I think that on both sides, in terms of moving the company, neither one was necessarily illegal, but one was certainly unethical. Um, and in due time, that would come back to the company. Um, they were already beginning to lose profit, was reported in the documentary. They did not go into the details, but I think it's important to analyze that just because something's not necessarily illegal, it still may be very unethical. You mentioned the phrase move the company, meaning move the, move the corporate governance structure how the company is operating. Correct, the direction of the company, um, moving towards the compensation committee, decreasing compensation, raising prices, things along those lines. Okay. I think there's tremendous, I'm sorry, um, I think there's just tremendous pressure um, dating back to the first question that you asked in terms of automation. I think that there might not necessarily be um, a, a clear cut solution and it may look like a better opportunity to um, support automation, but it's not necessarily ethical. Okay. So in your research, <coughs> um, how easy was it for Arthur S. to uh, strip uh, individuals of commitments that had been made to them uh, about their retirement benefits or these other issues. So, so was it relatively easy? Um, because as a private company, somehow uh, whatever assurances were made to the employee were set it in a way that said we have the option of not doing this. Do you know uh, what what made it so? It, because you understand the way a pension works, that you know, if you work really, really hard, even at lower than market wages for 30 years, the balance of that will be then when you're in retirement, you'll get all this more retirement than the average person. So the awkward reality is you're not supposed to be able to change that equation after they put in the hard work and before the benefits come to them. So do you are you aware of the the extent to which he had the legal ability to just do that, what he wanted to do? So I think because he didn't actually do it, it was a little bit more difficult to analyze, but essentially we're looking forward to the company. What's gonna be 20, 30 years out in the future once automation takes over and once you know the, it, uh, the company expands a little bit further. And I think that he was trying to put more of a hard stop on it rather than um, deprive people of their earnings already. Uh, building upon that, Arthur, as uh, he, as uh, Kelly said, he did not implement this. This was merely a plan of his, and it was something that he talked about with the fellow board, the, uh, fellow board of directors. 
he mentioned that he want, like he had a list of a lot of things he wanted to do. Um, one of the top things on the list were to eliminate RDT because he was really standing in the way of him properly managing the corporation how he wanted to. The other thing I was saying in his way was employee pension because he figured that the employees were getting way too much money and they wanted to put a stop to how much retirement benefits they were getting. And the third thing he wanted to do was to cut prices uh, not cut prices in the way where it would be lower, but cut prices, like cut that low pricing so prices would actually be higher because he wanted people to pay more money so he could get more money in turn. So no, nothing actually was implemented because it was stopped before it could actually happen. An immediate revolt, except for R RDT lost his job, right? Yes, RDT lost his job. That was the only thing that actually came to fruition. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with the viability of your solution in a competitive environment. I mean, Boston is begging to become the second headquarters of Amazon, right? And um, you've got tremendous competitive pressures from both Amazon and Walmart, and Walmart's the low cost leader, and that's part of what their value equation is. And your suggestion is that a strength in corporate culture will enable them to withstand those really dramatic industry pressures moving forward. Could you speak a little bit about how you see that? Yeah, I think that a strong corporate culture translates out to the consumer. Um, and Market Basket is known for their low prices as well as Walmart. Obviously, they're very competitive in that sense um, when compared to one another. But then there's the ethical element on top of that. And that, you know, if I can go somewhere and pay 90 cents for a loaf of bread, theoretically, or I can go somewhere and pay a dollar for a loaf of bread. But when I walk in, the experience is 10 times better in a market basket than it is in a Walmart. I'm probably gonna choose the market basket. I think that a lot of people would. And I think that a lot of people, especially in this area, um, especially even further uh, diving into uh, disadvantaged communities, really resonate with that, with that message. Yeah, uh, Market Basket has a large sense of collective identity. Uh, when someone shops at Market Basket, they feel like they're part of the Market Basket's family. They feel like they're part of the community. When I go to Walmart, I feel like I'm a guy in there to get stuff. I don't feel like I'm part of Walmart. I don't feel like I'm walking in and I'm getting that same love that I get at Market Basket. I shop at Market Basket all the time. Um, as I'm sure many people have, I don't know about people in this room, but I know of us from Lowell, many of us do shop at Market Basket because we get that feeling um, that we're actually part of something greater than ourselves. Um, and just to say too that we've never really seen anything like this. I mean like people protested, it was all over the news. People, employees, everyone got together. What It was national news. And we've never seen that from uh, a company like Market Basket, a grocery store, you know what I'm saying? So just that is just insane. It just shows how much the people care about the company and how much they care about the values. And why not, instead of trying to change what was so good about R13, what was so good about his vision, why not strengthen it even more? I would first, sorry. Oh, just to touch further on it too, that quote we actually showed at the beginning there was a customer. A lot of the protests that happened after the removal of RDT as the CEO were led by customers. Customers were even going as far to shop at competitors and drive to market basket locations and post the receipts on the door. And that's just kind of the culture they had where a lot of this protesting wasn't being led by the employees. A majority of it was actually led by the customers. And I don't think we've really seen many situations like that. I strongly believe that although you are only in New England currently, that these values would resonate everywhere. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, there was a moment in the presentation where you said uh, culture is on the decrease and uh, people equals culture, uh, which was really interesting. I never quite thought of it that way. And, I mean, you might be right. <clears throat> which would be brilliant if you're right. You might be wrong, though. Um, you know, I think I think of um, when you talk about automation. You know, I wonder if um, if an Amazon Go starts in the Boston area, but they give to little leagues and they give to this and they advertise at Red Sox uh, and the whole bit. You know, um, I wonder if it's people. Uh, 
uh, equals culture. I, I wonder if, if, the, if a company can have uh, a fantastic relationship with the community and its customers, even if there's no person standing there as you exit the store. Um, because there, you know, there are people in Seattle at Amazon, and if they cut a check to 50 Little League teams around uh, the Boston area, there's a lot of people who are gonna think, yay, Amazon, they support our community. And if there's not a person doing it here, it's some schmuck sitting in Seattle, but it's being done, so. And the other statement I heard, you use the phrase, once automation takes over, which is a little frightening uh, to say it that way. But you know, on the other hand, the presentation makes such a compelling argument that 50 years from now, when automation probably really will have taken over, I have a feeling that there's going to be a place in the market for, uh, for a place like Market Basket for the same reason that you just passionately said you shop there. Uh, I think there will be enough of a percentage of the population that will want to harken back to the old days of the 20 teens uh, to interact with uh, people. So I understand that automation might end up consuming most of the market share, but I don't think it's going to take over to the point that they will no longer have stores with human beings in them. And also to expand on that a little bit, you saw it a few years ago when the farmer's market trend really blew up out of nowhere and everybody wanted to shop at farmer's markets. There is a human desire to want to go to these markets where there is an impact within that community and you're meeting and talking to people that are part of your community. People that wanted to shop at a market basket, it's very similar to that that farmer's market because a lot of the vendors that they use are local vendors. They do, they have them come in there, they promote local vendors more so than your, your global companies that are in there. So I think that's very much an empowering thing that Market Basket's implemented that customers really like. They like that personal connection. They like being able to go in there and see the same people. I think one of the, one of the points that you made was we don't know, we might be right, we might be wrong based on whether this is going to be successful. Um, but I do think that a lot of companies in the world can throw a lot of money into communities um, in terms of donations, in terms of sponsorships, and that may be effective. Um, but I don't see any company being able to do this. And that's why we chose this company. And that's like, Arthur T, one thing he did was like he made sure he had a, con a connection with everyone. And I think that's a little different than just throwing money. Like when you, he visited an employee's husband in the hospital, held his hand like he was on his deathbed. And he made sure he felt that we're here for you, we're going to take care of your family, everything will be okay. And things like that make more of an impact than just, well, I'm just going to make this donation. Like donations, of course, help, but to feel that sense of like, we're here for you, we're here for this community. I think that makes a bigger impact and creates that culture, that community, that love that a lot of big companies can't really compete with. No, it's true, but robots don't have spouses that get cancer. <laughs> so there will be no cancer when it's just robots. So. Gentlemen, I'm all set. Just observations. Okay. Um, thank you. It's we're going to go that sort of a simulation portion of it, okay? Um, this one was hard for me, okay? A couple things. Grocery stores are inherently um, very challenged businesses in, in, in the industry in terms of cost and private cost and margin. Margins in groceries are, are about as low as you can get. Um, and, and turnover is profoundly important. For me, as, as I came to understand it, the essence of the case effectively comes down to uh, the, the, the ownership model of being a, a, a patrician owner who cares for and, and treats his customers like family versus the, the, what otherwise would be a more uh, contemporary model where the, the, the cost of benefits are a function of what the revenue stream and, and how profitable the company could be and how much of a wide versus narrow mode type of industry they're, work, they're operating in. Um, grocery uh, across the company, of course, it's, you know, it's no secret. The trend is going more and more towards the model of, of Walmart and, and Walmart Walmart's model adopts well into that industry for a variety of reasons. Um, 
for me, um, the, the legal and, and the financial elements of it were um, were not developing much at all, um, and uh, there are rather big gaps in your case. Um, in terms of the ethical element, and, and on one hand, I, I, rec I rec recognize and acknowledge the argument you make that this is a better way to treat people, but in terms of, of an ethical dilemma and element, um, uh, to bring one one side of the argument in terms of the competitor is unethical, and you're ethical because you treat your employees well, I, I don't know if that's an ethical argument, okay? Um, and it's, it, there's, there's not a legal or financial <coughs> line you cross by treating your employees one way or the other. Um, the, the employees can simply, you know, if the employee doesn't like it, the employee can walk. Um, but in, in terms of the ethical element of it, um, what I can see is there's a tradition of we treat our employees in such a way. Our threat takes control. He now changes the world to more typical of the overall industry. There's rebellion and, and, and disagreement and, and, so, and so forth, so we're going to change it back. Um, but it, it ultimately goes in terms of the ethical of, you know, what, what what is right and wrong in, in, in the context of what they expect and what they like to believe. Um, but first and foremost, everything begins in corporate America with, do I have a viable business model? Is my, can I survive? It sounds like the company has been able to do so within the community for a period of time, uh, which on one hand is positive and good, and that also, however, they're also the exception if that's the case. Because across America, this model, uh, this business model of a local grocery store has been going away. I, I live in the north of Chicago. I, I grew up in this area, but I live north of Chicago. And, and this model has been going away quickly. Um, so, on one hand, if this model is, or can be prolonged and, and be, be viable for a period of time, it's going to be under intense pressure and that's only going to increase. Yet at the same time, the ethical element of whether that model can be successful or not is, is really not an ethical question. It's more a matter of first and foremost business viability. That's how I see it, gentlemen. It, I've done a lot of things in my career. At one point, I was an executive in the direct mail industry. and. Um, uh, we, had, we were a service company, really fundamentally a commodity, printing and mailing, we buy that all over the place. But one of our customers was an agency in DC that was committed to helping cause-based nonprofits raise money for the good stuff that they do. So I flew from Los Angeles to DC to meet with our customer. And I walk into their lobby and it's filled with awards of basically celebrating how they're a bunch of great people helping good people do good things for good people. And so, so I come in and they invite me in to meet with the VP of procurement. And so I sit down and she closes the door and looks at me and says, we put people like you out of business every day, opening and sell them. And I just flown 3,000 miles for this. And I said, oh really? She said, yeah, we get you guys in a competitive downward spiral and you just put each other out of business as you're competing against one another and we don't care. And then I said, well, you know, we're really committed to relationship and building a long-term relationship of value and we're a trusting partner and I start going down that line. And her take was, we really don't care. Now we had customers that did care and that's where we worked to grow our business and in that industry, which was about a 5% margin business, we could charge about 5% extra for that trusting relationship and people would pay it, but they wouldn't pay six they'd pay five. Because they knew that if they were just shopping around for the lowest price, sometimes they'd get spanked and they would end up really losing in a bad relationship. So there was a bit of a calculation in that. But there was a, a very specific margin and the industry really couldn't support it. So that was what was going through my mind as I was asking, what's their profitability and what kind of margin and what can they invest in building corporate culture? And, I mean, I, I really fundamentally believe that the nature of business is to build relationships that really grow human relationship and really help humanity. You use phrases about stripping humanity and things like that. Really, business should be at the service of humanity. I really think there is a place for those kinds of trusted relationships, but I don't know how big it is. And I don't know how to calculate where it makes sense and where it will run into the limits. Um, and, and it really does boil down to this, this question of kind of uh, financial analysis of the viability of the model is one piece. So some of my questions, I was trying to, to get at that. 
Um, <clears throat> from an ethical dilemma standpoint, um, Walmart, Walmart's value is that it helps a family buy more stuff for their kids. That's really good. Bread's about three ninety nine a loaf. Well, right. And so, if I if I can get that for three bucks, and I can buy twenty five percent more bread, that's a good thing. So that might be one way to think about how to think about some of these dilemmas that are are present. So, anyways, I just was kind of processing through that. I was just trying to figure out how the business case could sustain what you were proposing and what the ramifications of that um, Yeah, I agree with uh, Jeff. Um, uh, I'm an ethicist, uh, and I've lived here for 11 years. So I, uh, I, I was here when all of this happened, and it, you're right, it was extraordinary, and, and for all the right reasons. And it, and it really was about ethics, um, uh, and it was in the context of <coughs> RDT had a, a, a vision, a long-time vision of a company that had multiple values. Uh, they cared about profit for the longevity of the organization and the ability to pay employees and pay suppliers and, and such, uh, but also cared about community, and then RDS came in and didn't give a damn about community and only cared about profit. So um, the I've been judging these things for 15 years. And so um, uh, I missed some things. And I, I, I know for a fact that you guys are smart, because I just spent the last half hour of my life listen, listening to you. You're smart, and you were passionate about this, and you know what you're doing, which is great. Um, there's a few things that I think we at IBEC failed, you know, failed to share. Um, the the presentation was 13 minutes. Um, it's when when we say you have between 25 and 30, the expectation is you're going to give us more. Uh, so the fact that it ended in 13 minutes meant that um, we we didn't get as much as we want. Um, and so I, uh, yeah, I've never seen anyone uh, not go to 23, 24, 25 minutes. Um, and this stopped at 13. Um, and they literally are looking, if with that extra time that you could have used up until 30, um, you know, five solid minutes just on the legal ramifications of this issue. For example, with a private company domiciled in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, would it have been possible for RDS to sue, uh, you know, a company ran by RDT because he cared about community? Some states have laws that would allow shareholders to sue, and some don't. And that would have been an interesting facet of this case, whether you know the family literally could sue because maybe the corporation is domiciled in Delaware. I don't know. Uh, but that's something that we expect that level of, de of detail on the legal uh, aspect. And then on the financial impact, um, we do want to see what are the last five years, uh, what's been their net income, you know, what has been uh, their profit, you know, uh, their overall revenue you shared and things like that. And so, you know, that, that's why this whole thing is designed to give you 25 to 30 minutes so that you have time to do that. Not that you guys don't have other classes. Uh, and in personal lives, I'm sure. So, um, and I'm not, and is it permissible for them to do the whole presentation without all five speaking? It, it's permissible, but it's not, it's not. Okay. All right. Fact, so, it's expected that everybody should speak. Yeah, so you're so smart and you're so good at what you did here. Um, and if we're lucky enough to get you to come back uh, next year and the year after that, um, if you have the benefit of having five people, even though it was great that you guys chimed in on the questions and stuff, um, uh, the design is that all five persons would speak during the presentation uh, and things. And so I, I'm nervous that we at IBEC uh, didn't convey that those, we consider those kind of rules. Uh, rules are, is the wrong word, but guidelines, <laughs> like Jack Sparrow says. Um, so the, uh, um, one of the legal implications is some states have laws against uh, a supermarket giving its food to food pantries if, if someone gets sick. 
So I, I'm born and raised in Southern California, and I think in Southern California, you're, if you're a supermarket, you're not allowed to give your food, you have to throw it in the trash can, which is awful, but because by 50 years ago, some homeless person died from um, salmonella or something, and so they passed a law saying you can't do that. Um, I'm glad you did this because it was, it was, like you said, an extraordinary moment uh, that summer of 14. Um, and you're brave to do it, it's a private company. So the, it's really, really, really hard to get to the finances. Uh, but there, there, there is room somehow uh, to give us something, you know, a slide that walks us through the, the finances. Um, I think the, the word forward is supposed to be the other one, F-O-R-E. W A R D, but anyway, I'm not sure. Maybe you're doing a little spin that he has a forward, uh, that the protester has a forward point of view. Um, the, use, the use of the quotations here was fantastic. Um, I really like that. Uh, and uh, it really gets things off in a nice way. Uh, Shaquin, uh, you have a gorgeous voice. Uh, and uh, it's very impressive uh, that you do this without notes. Uh, so, uh, we, we don't punish people who use notes as long as they're not reading them, but we are allowed to be impressed uh, when uh, the students somehow have found enough time and enough passion about it that you were able to do what you did without the notes. Um, the one challenge is um, every single second, if you don't have notes, your eyes are on the three of us. Every second. What you were doing is you were staring at the ground because in your mind you've been practicing this and you've memorized it and the easiest way for you to recollect what you've memorized was to stare at the ground but you're not allowed to stare at the ground so if you're as gifted as you are that you somehow memorize this you've got to look at our faces you've got to see our reactions to certain words and then you you might if you were really doing this like for a real job and and i've been in business ethics for 31 years i have literally done this presentation 25 times, because I used to be an ethics consultant, and it was my job to get hired just like you in this role play, and it was my job to go in front of the board of directors and make the case. So I've been in this position. You look in their eyes so that if Jeff uh, twists his head a little bit because of something you said, then you know to react to that and to say, you know, Jeff, is there something you, whatever, but you, you just pay attention to that. Um, but otherwise, you know, I, yeah, the, the passion is fantastic and great selection of the topic. Uh, I just, I don't mean to be rude at all. I would have loved to see if someone had whispered in your ear that it has to be a minimum of 25 minutes, which it doesn't. But it should be a minimum of 25 minutes. I would have been so excited to see some of the other, uh, what, what you would have done if someone would have told you, gosh darn it, make it at least, you know, 25. So. Guys, here's what's really great. <coughs> You're really emphasizing business isn't just about profit. That's right. Business has a social contract with a broader society and has a relationship of responsibility and reciprocity. Really great. That sometimes people think that the issue is between community and that bad corporate stuff that's just about profit and self-interest. And really the responsibility of business is to figure out how both of those things work. Because the social good really happens when the business works. And, and, but it's got to be the right kind of business structured in the right kind of way. All of the questions that you asked uh, in the example that you gave really are so important. So I just really, really want to honor that and thank you for that. Our struggle was trying to get at some of the details of how we can sink our teeth into it. That's what we were playing. As a team, do you guys have any questions for us? Sure. I, I have a few comments. Um, First of all, I would like to appreciate all you guys for taking time it's like for us. Like we really appreciate this. We all worked hard for it, and we thank you for your feedback because it's it's very much appreciated. Um, there was like I think quite a bit of miscommunication, or else we would have been here full force with 25 to 30 minutes. Um, there were some selections that we had omitted, um, like uh, when you mentioned legalities. We wanted to go in to some of the family businesses. Um, what it really came down to was, I mean, we're past it now, but was an issue of shareholding and that one woman was the one who affected it by switching from RDT's side when he had majority share, which allowed him to do so much, to switching to RDS's side because RDS was like, hey, we can get money. And uh, we failed to 
uh, talk about that. It was literally like, um, it was a huge mission on our part. Uh, we did not know that we needed all five people to speak for this. We planned it for um, us to, to do the presentation for the 20 minutes, and then another two were going to do the 10, and then one was going to do the 90. And that's so, yeah. fair, and, and I shouldn't say the word need, uh, because there isn't a rule that says that it has to happen, but I will tell you that the judges received some training, and you deserve to know how we are trained about who's going who should get first place and second place and third place. And when we're trained, we are trained to be happier uh, when all five do it. Um, and, and I see exactly what you've done, because uh, I've been a professor at a university that brought a team to this competition, and I was very, very tempted to have one person do the 90 second and one or two persons do the 10 minute and everything. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk to Tom and, uh, about uh, to reduce the likelihood that there ever be any uh, miscommunication. I can't imagine in all the years that we've done this that a team ever would get first place or something like that if they only went for 13 minutes uh, or something. Because um, we're comparing you against other teams that went 28 and 29, and guess what? They had more content because <laughs> uh, <coughs> they spoke for double the amount of time. Uh, so it, it doesn't matter. What's, what matters is that you uh, learn so much and you got right to the heart of what Jeff has said twice. That this is business ethics. Is it possible to be responsible and sufficiently profitable and care about the community at the same time? Or is capitalism designed and destined to make sure that the RDSs of the world bury the RDTs six feet under so that we never have to see them again? What is the way capitalism was supposed to be when it was invented? And what, what do we want it to be today? Not want it, what should it be today? Because capitalism is controlled by humans. We have the power to turn capitalism into what it is meant to be, which is something which is meant to make human lives better. And so you picked a fantastic case that pitted two relatives named Artie uh, against each other who had two completely different visions of what capitalism is supposed to be. Thank you. I'm a faculty advisor for UMass Lowell and I just want to thank you guys again. I know you're very grateful and I want to make sure that you know that these students do not have a class. This was actually volunteer time for them in addition to a full schedule and working. And it's UMass Lowell's first team and so we're going to take all of the knowledge that we just gained and go back and uh, share it with our teams in the future, and probably be bringing more than one team in the future. Um, so we are super grateful for, you know, I, didn't, I also didn't know exactly how the makeup of the judges would be, so having it not be all professors is gonna make a big difference as well, um, and I appreciate that knowledge very much in your time. Yeah, it's all meant to be a learning experience, so you know, I live locally, you know, uh, let me know, uh, at my university, when I got there, we didn't have a class for it. I persuaded the dean to create a class for it, uh, and it was uh, and it, it was wonderful because it wasn't as stressful as it is for you guys. The team would come to we we did more than just this competition. We did two or three competitions uh, in the spring uh, because it was a class and everything, and uh, they really enjoy it, uh, and they learned a lot to the extent if any one of you ever gets a job with Deloitte or KPMG and, or McKinsey, and you literally will be delivering presentations like this the way that I did. So, uh, and they, did you ever see the videos? We did see the videos. We didn't know about the time constraint. Okay. That we did know. Um, we, it, it, I, we remember, definitely it's not a know rule, it's a guideline. People had to speak. <coughs> that, I, I, we had known that, obviously. We, when you announced it at the beginning, we then made an immediate change so that they would announce their names because we didn't even know they all had to be here. Actually, it would have worked out better for us if they weren't here, because then we would have thought your whole team, is there a minimum number of speakers? Is it two or three? Two, three, three, okay. Uh, or something like that. So, not a problem. I can't advise them to deceive the judges. <laughs> <laughs> you could just say that you have an imaginary friend named Harvey. Yeah. Um, but uh, this, um, this is, uh, our team, the, the first year that we went, we came in last place, but it was a learning experience. Uh, and so um, ask the questions, and the most important thing is, sadly, some too many of you are seniors. Yeah. Evan, yay, okay, Evan, and who's Eliana? 
Okay, so you'll be hopefully back next year in Los Angeles, which will have better weather uh, than we have now. And the big responsibility for the seniors, but especially Evan and Eliana, is to inspire freshmen and sophomore to look forward to this plan for it in advance. And that if you can succeed in getting, you can get a class because you just got a new million dollar ethics center. Yeah, we're the co-directors actually. Okay, um, so but this is all everyone together, is talking like about the new, uh, the new thing Wonderful. and your, your dean is uh, Neymar? Sandra Schmeier. So Sandra's a friend of mine. And so if you want my help in getting Sandra to give money to create a class, then we'll do that. Well, we'll take you up on that. So yeah, so anyway, uh, this so is fantastic. Much. You should all be very proud. Yeah, and, and you guys want to stop. So the experience is really what you ended up having, which is that you're in front of executives and you get an insight on how executives think. So, so executive, my experience has been that when an idea comes forward, the first thing is the executive is going, you know, we want to do the right thing, but hey, can we afford this? What's this, what's this going to cost and can we afford it? And you know, they want specifics because they want to be able to check, yeah, this is, this is reasonable. Then the second one is, what are the laws? Are, 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 are we getting sued? Are there legal challenges? Are there risks associated for future lawsuits? So what, what's the legal environment for this? And then once we're past that, now, what really is the right thing to do? And that's a combination of for our business and for our community and the ways that we spoke about that before. So, so take that feedback as part of the benefit of this experience. That's really how boards and executives kind of track on what they're trying to think through as they're hearing things. Yeah, Jeff's, Jeff's points are outstanding. I will add one more. In, in uh, the company I work for, I have a chance to have encounter and sit down with CEO monthly. And almost every time, either the chief executive or the chief operating officer, he's sitting, he and, and she are sitting there and they are asking two fundamental questions. Who are we? What are we about? Is this consistent or inconsistent in the context of any decision that's going to require major commitment of capital resources? Is this consistent and, and further reinforces what, what, who we are and what we're about, or is it takes away from those things? Um, the next part is, it, it really follows from those things. How does this help me be more or less competitive, differentiate, or, or realize the promise of what my brand is to my customer? Thank you. Absolutely. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.